can everyone hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, I think there was supposed to be one of the organizers here to announce me, but I don't see anyone and it's time, so I guess I'll just start. Um, yeah, so when I started looking into SyncIO, I noticed that a lot of people thought it was quite complicated to use and especially to get started with it. So I gave this talk the subtitle, Do You Need to Be a Wizard to Use It? And the answer is oh, a little bit. Uh, it's not that hard, but when you're just getting started, there are quite a few problems that you'll run into. And, well, concurrency is intrinsically complicated, so it's not anyone's fault, but there are a lot of new concepts. There are things you need to learn that are not just standard Python, and it has a very long history, all the way from the backports to 2.7 to the new keywords in 3.5. The syntax has changed a lot, and the things you do have changed a lot. So when you try to figure out how to do something, uh, there's not one way to do it. There are different ways in different versions, and they will change quite a lot, and sometimes the documented be best practice you will find is maybe deprecated now, so yeah, that can be a problem. And if you don't know the internals, some things will just be weird, but um, you get used to those quite quickly, and fortunately the code is quite easy, the AsyncIO code on GitHub is quite easy to read, so you can look at the internals and figure those out. And there's a lot of incompatible terminologies, like coroutines are generators, except when they're not generators, and not all generators are coroutines, and you know, you have APIs like Future that implements the same API, but it's not, you cannot really use them interchangeably, and you'll run into trouble with those things. And since it's so new, there's this bottom-up approach to learning AsyncIO, so you wanna, um, it's very common that you start uh, understanding first coroutines, that, well, first generators coroutines, and have to understand all the internals before you actually start writing code with SyncIO. So my idea was try to simplify this and try to go through how I've learned SyncIO and how I started writing things and the errors I uh, ran into and see how other people can start writing code with SyncIO from this. And um, I work at a web agency and I came to SyncIO because sometimes the things we have to do are concurrent in nature and I noticed that some of my coworkers just started going to other languages, mainly Go, and saying, well, this is too complicated to do in Python, I'll just write it in Go, create a service, and then we can call the service to do, uh, th to solve this problem. But uh, I realized that Python just added this whole thing to do concurrency that has changed the way concurrency is supposed to be done in Python and we were not really using that. So I tried to see, well, can we do this with the SyncIO instead? And some of the problems we're trying to solve are things like creating a backend service for, a server for real time d with server sent events or web sockets. And that would look something like this. This is a very simple echo server, but it's not very far from something you could actually use to run a web socket server. Um, we could, for example, try to fetch data from several APIs concurrently, which I think is something that is very common, especially when you're doing service-oriented architecture. You may have tons of APIs that you want to get data from, and if each one of these takes about 100 milliseconds and you want to query 5 to 10, you might end up spending a whole second just waiting for I.O. Well, you could do this concurrently. So, this is quite easy to do with a sync IO. It would look something like this. And you don't have to pay too much attention to this example, so I'll look at them in more detail later. Um, you can do some sort of pipeline processing, which is very similar to before. Uh, instead of just fetching the URLs, you may want to process them afterwards. Maybe you want to put them in Redis. Maybe you want to uh, parse them as JSON. And all these things you can do asynchronously. And you could copy a site into disk, again, fetch a bunch of URLs, then lock a file and write to that file. Or you may want to have a complex data structure that you want to have in memory and you want to access, but you want that every now and then this gets loaded from um, 
a store somewhere. And that would look something like this. Uh, this is just a sample code, but you know, it would work uh, kind of in the same way. And so as you can see, all of these examples follow kind of the same pattern. And that pattern is the concurrency model that we're gonna be using. And there are several models that you could use and different languages implement different ones and they're normally a combination of different concurrency models. And so I think IO is basically a formalization of how we should do concurrency in Python. Now, I think there are two parts to concurrency models. The first one is how we write and understand our code. And I think this is the most important one. This is the one that we should focus on. And you can see that as an API. If you wanted to write an API for concurrency, you could come up with something like this. You could execute something in the foreground, execute something in the background, wait for a result, or schedule execution for things later. And you can write some functions to do this. And this is just like a pseudocode of something we may want to do if we wanted to have this concurrency model. And if we did that concurrency model, that would yield programs that look a certain way. Now AsyncIO will give us programs that look in the AsyncIO way. And that will be a unified model of how we do concurrency in Python. So the other part of a concurrency model is when the code runs. And it can run traditionally in threads and processes. You can run it on different machines if you use something like MPI. Or you can run it on event loop. And the event loop is a big part of what the SNKO model builds upon. And I don't, I'm not gonna look too much into this part of things because I don't think it matters that much. I'm gonna look into the other one that is, how is the code gonna look and how we're gonna understand that that code is correct and does what we want from the point of view of concurrency. And then these things might be interchangeable later. So let's start looking a little bit to Python's answers to these questions. But before we do that, I wanna tell you what async programming in Python is not. And that is just one thing and is a solution to your guild problems. So if you uh, are writing code that runs a lot of Python, spends a lot of time in the C Python interpreter, you're still gonna run into the global interpreter lock and this is not gonna save you from it. There are some projects like the Galactomy and PyPy STM that uses software transactional memory that are trying to fix this in different ways, but you know, we'll have to see what they come up with. But for now, if you're gonna do something that is in, that the gill is getting in the way, then you'll just have to go and run them in different processes like we've been doing for years. So, okay, let's get started. Let's write some code. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to uh, discuss this one just to get it out of the way. And we said that things can run in threads and processes. And that's fine, we can create uh, thread pools and with thread pools we can then tell them to execute a process. And it will look something like this, but we can also run things on an event loop. And this is the one that is new. If we wanna run something in an event loop, we first need to know what an event loop is. And anybody that's worked with JavaScript probably knows this and many of you probably do, but in case you don't, it looks something like this. Um, it's just a loop that will run essentially forever and it will pick a task and based on some policy and ask that, ask that task to be executed and that task will execute it until it decides to suspend execution. And uh, as you can see, there's nothing here that is preemptive like with threads. The task will execute and eventually that task will have to tell the loop that it has returned from a function so that it can continue running. Otherwise, the loop will be blocked right there. Once the task suspends execution, then it can reschedule that task, decide if the task has a result and it wants to do something with that result, maybe we wanna store it. Otherwise, we just put that task back, back in our queue and select it again when we loop back. And if we wanna use an event loop in Python, it looks kind of like this. You have uh, a function and you can define that function with the async keyword in Python 3.5. And when you 
define a function that is supposed to run asynchronously, that is, the async keyword tells the function that it's supposed to run asynchronously. So that function will not execute unless a loop calls it. And then we have the await keyword to tell the loop when it's supposed to suspend execution. So then we get an event loop and we tell it to run that function until it completes. And that actually works. And if we wanted to specify we want to run these things on threads instead, we don't write asynchronous functions and we take a normal blocking function that we want to run on a thread and we have this utility called running executor that will actually allow us to just run that function and it will return something that is asynchronous and that the loop knows how to handle. So this gives us the flexibility of being able to write our code, write code that will look the same way and then choose whether it's gonna run in threads, processes or in an event loop and have everything controlled through this event loop abstraction. Now, let's start writing some async code. What do we need to know? We need to know the async and await syntax, which if we wanna have a function that is not asynchronous, that just blocks, then that's fine. We just write a regular function and we call it whenever we need it. If we wanna have a function that runs on an event loop and that can suspend execution, then instead we use the async keyword and that function will not run by itself. Inside that function, we can use await and await will just, it's very similar to a return, except when the function comes back, it will continue execution from there. So we tell the loop that we will suspend execution until some other uh, function or awaitable has finished. And in this case, it would be suspend execution or that executor where we're running uh, the blocking function. And one of the advantages of this is that this way we can specify explicitly when our code will suspend and when it will <coughs> execute. So if we were to run this with threads, the operating system will tell us when the function can uh, stop or when it can't. So we have to be a lot more careful in terms of synchronization. Whether here the function will continue to run until that function decides by itself that it will stop. The other building block that we will need with this is futures. So a future is basically a wrapper that can, you can check, it has three methods. You can check if it's done, you can check if it has a result, or you can add a result to it. So when you have a future and you check if it's done, it normally isn't, unless you have added a result to it, then if you ask for a result and it doesn't have it, it will yield an exception, otherwise, it will, uh, you can set a result and then you will get a result. And now we, now we know this background information, so let's try to get a loop and start running things. So we have a loop, we wanna create it, run it, stop it, and schedule things on it. So to create a loop, we use a syncio, get event loop, and that's it, now we have a loop. And it's not doing anything, but we have one. Now, if you wanna run it, you can just call run forever on it and it will do as it says, it will run forever unless there's an exception inside the loop, in which case it would just throw the exception. Mm. Now, uh, if we wanted to stop a loop, and I think this is a little bit confusing, uh, a loop can only be stopped if it's running. So if you have a loop and you wanna tell it to stop, you will have to ask it, after you ask it to be marked as stop, you need to ask it to run once. Otherwise, the loop will not be considered stopped. So if you wanna stop a loop that is not currently running, you have to ask it to run forever and it will run once and then stop. Which is confusing, is the type of things that you have to look at the internals to understand how it works, but uh, most of the times you don't have to do this. Uh, Instead, what you do is something like this. You wanna run things on a loop instead of managing it manually. So let's say we have this function that we wanna run. Something, it just prints a bunch of numbers and it waits one second between each number. So you ask the loop to run and to complete and that's it, it prints as we expected it to. It's just a little bit boring. So instead what we would want to do, if we've been talking about concurrency, is run something more like this. We say, well, we, want to have two of those functions running concurrently. And if we do that, uh, we can use this ensure future that will just create a future and attach it to the loop. 
and we write an extra function because we only know so far how to run one thing. So we say, well, okay, go loop, and then when we execute that, that would actually stop very quickly and give us an error. And the reason this is happening is because we created these two futures, but we didn't really, nobody's waiting for them. So when the loop, lo the loop runs, it runs the go function and it knows that we'll, it will stop when the go function completes. So that function creates one future, it doesn't wait for it, creates the second future, doesn't wait for it, and then it completes, so the loop stops running. And if you're debugging as in IO, you will get this nice, helpful messages. So instead, what we can do is just await them, and then we use await and we tell the loop, well, I wanna run these two things, but I wanna wait for them. Don't end go until they are complete. And if you do that, it will work, but if you look at the result, you can see that it's actually running one task first and the second task afterwards. So it's not really concurrent, it's just sequential, and you might as well just have written regular functions. So instead what we can do is try to figure this out and go back to the specification and see that we have asyncio.ask completed. So we can create this uh, task that we wanna run and then we ask asyncio to give it back to us in a for loop in the order they complete. And when one of them completes, we get the future, we wait for its result, and then this works, uh, except it's really ugly. It's, this doesn't really look very Pythonic and it's very complicated for just running a couple of things concurrently. So what we have instead is this um, icon aggregators or the iter tools of asyncio, where we can do things like asyncio.wait, which just will take a lot of coroutines or a list of tasks and not return until all of them have completed. So if we run something like that, we're actually running concurrently now and it still looks quite ugly, but we can realize that if, you, if we're awaiting for a syncio.wait, wait, then that means that a syncio.wait wait is an awaitable, and that means that we can run that directly on our loop. And then it would look something like this, and this looks a lot more like an API we would want to work with. Create a bunch of tasks and ask the loop to wait for all of them and execute them concurrently. And, okay, um, I wanted to make an aside here and remember the internals and how they can be complicated. We have also this function for a loop to run once instead of running uh, forever or until something completes. And we shouldn't call it, it's an underscore function, but it's there, so you call it, and then you can see that you can run a loop step by step. So whenever you're debugging a sync IO, you can just start running your loop step by step and printing stuff and you'll see what's actually happening. Okay, but those are quite boring functions. They're just printing stuff. So let's try to build something that retrieves some results. So I changed the function a little bit, now it's a countdown and now it just multiplies the numbers as it goes down and returns the result. So we create our list of tasks and we wait on them and we assume that the tasks are gonna have some information for us when we get back. The thing is what we get is these coroutines and they're coroutines that have already executed so they're not very useful. We can't really get any information from them. So we can try to go back and say, well, I remember futures were something that I could use for knowing the results of things that haven't happened so we create them as futures instead and run that and yeah, now we have this task and the task is just, um, is just a coroutine wrapped in a future uh, that the loop is using internally. And that's good, we can access things from tasks, so we uh, iterate on over them, and that's it, we get the results there. It's just, we made this look ugly again. And so instead what we can do is go back to our aggregator list in the sync IO, which they're not called aggregators there, by the way, that's just the name I give them. Um, and we have this one called gather that does very, something very similar to wait, except it will actually return all of the results. And since the loop returns whatever uh, the function it was running returns, then we can just print those results. And it does the same thing as before, except it just looks a lot better now. So, okay, 
what have we learned so far? We have a sync and a wait. We can create awaitable functions whose execution can be suspended. And um, with a wait, we can suspend until another awaitable returns. We have a loop that we can create. We can ask it to run. We can ask it to run something or run forever, and we can stop it. And we have these functions that allow us to wait for things so that we can run many things uh, concurrently and at the same time get the results after or just make sure that we wait for all of them. So, okay, that's good. With that, we can probably start writing some a little bit more realistic code. And we can write something like this. This is uh, an example, as I said before, just fetching a bunch of URLs. You wanna get those URLs and you wanna get them all at the same time. Um, or concurrently and then just gather their results. And you could do something like that and this works. It will fetch all the URLs and all the URLs will be there at the end. The only thing is that uh, maybe we don't care about all of those URLs. So we can try to do something a little bit more complex and say, well, maybe I just care about the first URL to return. So let's write something that wants to solve that. So we can write first complete it. And it's very similar to before, so we just went back to this as completed idea that has a timeout. And we just wait for those, um, wait for those coroutines to complete, and when the first one completes, we just return that, and that's it. And this looks like it would do the work, except when we execute it, we get a lot of errors. And the reason we, this is actually returning, you can see the HTML up there, that was supposed to be returned. But then we're getting all this test that have been destroyed and the loop that hasn't been closed. And the thing is, with AsyncIO, you have to do explicit cleanup. You're supposed to close your own loops and clean up your own mess. So let's start just by closing the loop manually so that it will internally clean up some stuff for us. And that looks good, uh, except at least we got rid of one error, but we still have this test pending. And the reason those tasks are pending is because if we, mm, yes, uh, yeah. If we, if we go back to our original code, you can see that uh, we're returning after the first task completes. This is not the one, this one. We're returning as after the first task completes. So the other ones are still in the loop and they're supposed to be executed, but we're never waiting for them. No one is waiting for those tasks. So what we can do instead is something like this. We say, well, we're gonna execute, um, do this exact same code, except we're gonna wait for all the tasks before this function returns. And that works, that gives us the right result. The only problem is that this takes as long as the longest wait. And if some APIs are slower than the others, you get some that return in one millisecond and some that return in 100 milliseconds, then you're gonna, get the first one, that's the result you're returning, but then you're gonna have to wait 100 milliseconds to, until all the other ones complete. So instead, what you can do is something like this, I guess. You start working with it, you write another function, say, well, now I wanna cancel all my tasks, and then within your cleanup, you, uh, you first run your function that returns what you want, great, and on cleanup, before closing the loop, you uh, cancel all the existing tasks. And yeah, that works. Uh, it's not nice, it's not very Pythonic anymore, I think. So instead what you have is, well, if we go back to the API and we use wait before, and wait actually has other parameters like uh, a timeout and return when, and we can tell wait to return when the first task completes. and what wait returns is actually two sets of futures, one for the tasks that have been completed and one for the tasks that are pending. So we do something like that for the pending task, we ask them to cancel and for com the completed one, we just uh, get the first future and return that. And this will work, this prints what we want and get us the result we want. The only issue is that this example is very well matched to what wait does. So, uh, yeah, if we wanted to return not the first completed, but maybe the first two, then this doesn't do the work anymore. So 
we would probably have to go back to something like cancel all or have to write our own function that deals with these things. But it's good to have this, um, the separate options that we, uh, yeah, we, we can either do wait and then deal with the pending ones or we can just uh, write our function and then cancel the other ones. Or we could cancel them manually somewhere else. But yeah, so whenever we're working with SyncIO, the important thing here is uh, we have to do cleanup and it's not always trivial. And we have to close everything whenever we use um, sockets, readers, executors, everything has to be closed manually. We shouldn't expect the framework to close things for us. And we should know where our tasks are. So, okay. Um, gonna l make this a little bit more fun before we end and now we have this first um, first completed API and let's say this is a very critical part of our code. We normally query hundreds of APIs and it's very important that we just get the first one quick and we might have something else in our stack that is not Python and wants to use this so let's just build a server that returns this. And so for this we just, we're gonna use the same code as we used before. And then we're gonna try to get a server that serves first completed. So we go to our documentation, we get the, this is basically the easiest server you can build. This is right from the documentation that's slightly modified. And right now this is an echo server. It's just like, okay. Uh, so this runs in a sync IO, it runs in a loop, and if we want to uh, build our own function into it, we can just do something like this instead, where this is exactly the same as the echo server we worked on before, we just changed this code here in the middle that is just calling first completed and waiting for it. So, um, and this works, you can run this code and it will, uh, execute, it will run uh, a server, you can do netcat to it and you can, and the good thing is that it will write, write just from the example and adding a function there. You will have a working server that executes and can uh, handle a lot of requests. But if we wanted to do, instead of using just plain sockets, do HTML, we can start looking at SyncIO libraries and look, for example, to into AIO HTTP. Again, just the same. This is the basic AIO HTTP server. Just hook our uh, function there, and we have a completely asynchronous server that is returning while running and fetching things concurrently. So, okay, um, is this an overkill? Yeah, probably. It's uh, we don't really need to build a server for this, but it's good that we can and we can do it while running everything within one thread in a loop while using the same uh, framework that we will use for all concurrency in Python. So for other use cases, maybe something we would want to do instead is just run the loop on a thread and we can do that too. We can have our synchronous code and that, that is our normal Python that is uh, Python code that we'll be running and we can put the loop on a separate thread and then assign things to it for it to run them and then get them back. Uh, things get a little bit more complicated here, uh, but this will work and you just have to get your, uh, make sure you clean things up and make sure you always call for the loop to run uh, thread safe. And there's a lot much to a sync IO that I'm not gonna have time to go into there are low level APIs, there's uh, specific like queues for synchronization that are quite useful and you can build your own protocols for your servers and there are a lot of cool hacks and you should go check out the internals. They, if you go to GitHub, Python, SyncIO, you have the actual code there that is very easy to read and that's basically the whole implementation. And out of the external stuff for SyncIO, the one that they wanted to name uh, in itself is the possibility of creating alternative event loops. We can do, can use this framework while using 
uh, event loops that do not come with a sync I.O. And one of those is UV loop, which, uh, uh, yeah, which uses uh, a, a lot of things internally, but it claims to be very, very fast. And if you uh, look at their benchmarks, it's up there faster than Node.js and about as fast as Go. And you, this is something that you can just plug in. You can run any of the code we've been writing and just change the loop and use UB loop instead, and it will work with a separate loop. So the, the flexibility that this gives us is that we can write the same code and understand the code using this framework, but at the same time, we can change the internals that will run it in different ways and change how it will execute. And there are a lot of third-party libraries for pretty much everything you want. So if you want to start playing with SyncIO, get some of these and start writing some asynchronous code. Thank you. <laughs>